Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Martian Way by Isaac Asimov. So this is a short story collection of four short stories. I shall read you the blurb of each of them, that will probably help. A four-star quartet from the most popular science fiction writer of our time. The Martian Way, when its water supply is cut off by Earth, it looks like the end of a Martian colony. Until someone has a bright idea about the rings of Saturn. Youth. Two kids on an alien planet keep two lost Earth astronauts as pets. The Deep. Roy, scouting for an extraterrestrial race, is disgusted by what he learns of Earth's biology. Sucker bait. The lethal force of a killer planet baffles a crew of top scientists until the despised kid from the mnemonic service remembers an old 20th century report. And this used to be three and sixpence back in the day, according to the back. So I'm just going to go through and uh, pick up some of the things that I tabbed. So we'll start with the Martian Way. And yeah, the plan is basically to travel to the rings of Saturn and to bring back ice from the rings of Saturn so that there can be water on Mars, because basically the people on Earth don't want to give the people on Mars any water. I think this is quite an interesting insight. Bear in mind this was first written in 1955. There's some fascinating stuff on climate change and that kind of stuff here. Our ancestors burned the oil of Earth madly and willfully. They destroyed its coal recklessly. We despise and condemn them for that, but at least they had this excuse. They thought that when the need arose, substitutes would be found. And they were right. We have our plankton farms and our protein micropiles. <laughs> but there is no substitute for water, none. There never can be. And when our descendants view the des desert we will have made of Earth, what excuse will they find for us? I thought this was pretty funny. So that one of the guys who volunteers to go on this mission, he's got a wife. And um, he s it says here, so, Back on the planetoid surface, Swenson said, All the time I watched that damned rock coming down, I kept saying to myself, This can't happen. We can't let it happen. Hell, said Riaz, we were all nervous. Did you see Jim Davis? He was green. I was a little jumpy myself. That's not it. It wasn't just dying, you know? I was thinking that Dora warned me I'd get myself killed. She'll never let me hear the last of it. Isn't that a crummy sort of attitude at a time like that? Listen, said Riaz. You wanted to get married, so you got married. Why come to me with your troubles? My camera battery ran out when I was last filming. Uh, as you know, I ran out of space. But I also don't remember where I was. Uh, I think I was just summing up the last bit of the Martian way. It was I. So moving on to youth. Two kids on an alien planet keep two lost Earth astronauts as pets. Uh, let's see what we've got here. So I think this is interesting because people today are like this. They don't know where the food comes from. Red said, shh, look, you take this stuff and stick it in the cage. I've got to scoot back to the house. What is it? Slim reached reluctantly. Ground meat. Holy smokes, haven't you ever seen ground meat? That's what you should have got when I sent you to the house instead of coming back with that stupid grass. Slim was hurt. How do I know they don't eat grass? Besides, ground meat doesn't come loose like that. It comes in cellophane and it isn't that colour. Sure, in the city. Out here we grind our own and it's always that colour till it's cooked. You mean it isn't cooked? Slim drew away quickly. Red looked disgusted. Do you think animals eat cooked food? Come on, take it. It won't hurt you. I tell you, there isn't much time. I thought this bit was quite cool as well. Almost prescient, I guess. But creatures may be intelligent and not reasonable. Our forefathers were presumably intelligent, yet they were certainly not reasonable. Was it reasonable to destroy almost all their tremendous civilization in atomic warfare over causes our historians can no longer accurately determine? The industrialists brooded over it. From the dropping of the first atom bomb over the eastern islands of the sun, I forget the ancient name, there was only one end in sight, and in plain sight, yet events were allowed to proceed to that end. So yeah, I wasn't a particular fan of that story, but it did have a couple of bits that were food for thought, as you can tell there. We'll move on to the deep. I didn't particularly like this one either, actually, but uh, this is a, this is Royd scouting for an extraterrestrial race. is disgusted by what he learns of Earth's biology. I thought this was kind of a cool illustration of a concept called Moore's Law. Basically, the number of transistors you can get on any piece of electronic equipment tends to, I think it doubles or takes up half the space every couple of years. So it says here, uh, Gan picked up the black cube that was the receiving station and looked at it soberly, somberly. Three generations before, it had been thought impossible to manufacture one with all the required properties in a space less than 20 cubic yards. They had it now. It was the size of his fist. So here we have some of this disgust at Earth biology. No, no, it's universal. The female in charge was the infant's mother. Impossible. Its own mother? Of necessity. The infant had passed the first part of its existence inside its mother. Physically inside. The creature's eggs remain within the body. They are inseminated within the body. They grow within the body and emerge alive. Great caverns, Gan said weakly. The stace was strong within him. Each creature would know the identity of its own child. Each child would have a particular father. And he would be known too. My host was being taken 5,000 miles, as nearly as I could judge the distance, to be seen by its father. 
Unbelievable. Okay, so I'm just going to move on to the last story now, which is Sucker Bait, which is this, this last one. We have these mnemonics in it, which are very cool. Uh, I'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so um, this guy is called Mark. He's in, the, he's in the mnemonic service. And the captain of the ship he's on says, That's so? Never heard of it. What is it? Mark said indignantly, It's the mnemonic service, that's all. It's my job to look at anything I want to and to ask anything I want to. And I've got a right to do it. Sounds like an ideal job. And so this is basically what the role of the mnemonic service is. So um, the captain said, that's what computers are for. Sheffield said, computers are limited, captain. They have to be asked questions. What's more, the questions have to be the kind that can be put into a limited number of symbols. What's more, computers are very literal minded. They answer exactly what you ask and not what you have in mind. Sometimes it never occurs to anyone to just ask the right question or feed the computer just the right symbols. And when that happens, the computer doesn't volunteer information. What we need, what all mankind needs, is a computer that is non-mechanical, a computer with imagination. There's one like that, Captain. The psychologist tapped his temple. In everyone, Captain. Maybe, grunted the Captain. But I'll stick to the usual, eh? Kind you punch your button. And uh, so this guy calls the Captain, he just refers to him as being non-compos. And uh, Sheffield suppressed a smile. Did he call you that? What is it? Just short for non-compos mentis. Everyone in the service uses it for everyone not in the service. You're one, I'm one. It's Latin for not quite of, not of sound mind. And you know, Captain, I think they're quite right. But the problem is, is it's not all nice to be a mnemonic. So Sheffield felt responsible. He felt responsible for everything about Mark, whether it was actually his fault or not. He and men like himself had taken Mark and children like him and trained them into personal ruin. They had been force grown. They had been bent and molded. They had been allowed no normal contact with normal children lest they develop normal mental habits. No mnemonic had contracted a normal marriage, even within the group. I think this is also interesting as well when you talk about global warming and whatnot. I mean, this was written in 1955, and listen to this. Carbon dioxide is only about half what it is on Earth, and it's the carbon dioxide that gives the hothouse effect. It lets the short waves of sunlight pass through to the planet's surface, but doesn't allow the long waves of planetary heat to radiate off. When carbon dioxide concentration goes up as a result of volcanic action, the planet heats up a bit and you have a Carniboniferous age, with oceans high and land service at a minimum. When carbon dioxide goes down as a result of vegetation refusing to let a good thing alone, fattening up on the good old CO2 and losing its head about it, temperature drops, ice forms, a vicious cycle of glaciation starts, and voila. Well there he's basically talking about what causes global warming. Except obviously there he's talking about volcanoes, but that was 1955. I like this little quote, which is kind of lifted from Oscar Wilde, to be fair, but uh, Simon says, A psychologist is a man who can explain anything and prove nothing. I thought this is great as well. The, um, what's his name? The uh, mnemonic um, employee. Basically, there's this culture in which people are perceived as the experts and you don't question the experts because they're the experts and you're not. So um, the mnemonic guy basically spins this tale and it's all absolute bollocks. And uh, you said, said Simon, thoroughly confused, and in a voice that was beginning to strangle, that it was your professional opinion that... My professional opinion. Space and little comets, Simon. What's so magic about a professional opinion? A man can be lying, or he can just plain be ignorant, even about the final details of his own speciality. A professional can be wrong because he's ignorant of a neighbouring speciality. He may be certain he's right and still be wrong. Look at you, you know all about what makes the universe tick, and I'm lost completely except that I know that a star is something that twinkles and a light year is something that's long. And yet you'll swallow gibberish psychology that a freshman student of Mentix would laugh his head off at. Don't you think, Simon, it's time we worried less about professional opinion and more about overall coordination? Fair point. I like this little quote here as well. A new voice, quite agitated, joined the melee. What are you talking about? You're no physician. It was Novi. I know that, said Mark earnestly. But I once read a very old book about poisons. It was so old that it was printed on actual sheets of paper. The library had some and I went through them because it was such a novelty, you know? Actual sheets of paper. So yeah, Asimov as always is pretty forward thinking in his ideas and he suggests a whole bunch of like concepts that I think are super cool and which I haven't thought of before. Again, I particularly enjoyed The Martian Way and Sucker Bait. The other two weren't as good, but you always get that with a short story collection. Overall, I thought it was pretty solid. I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. It's not Asimov's best, but it's certainly worth reading, especially if you're a fan of his. So there you have it, that's what I thought of The Martian Way by Isaac Asimov. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so, what you thought of it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.